We know about different types of uh, the mantic arts, you know, cartomancy, uh, bibliomancy, the ways in which we use particular tools to divine the future. Tools for looking into what's going to happen down the line. You know, it's an extraordinary uh, requirement of being a human being is that we have the capacity to plan ahead, but we don't quite know everything that's going to happen. And so it's, it's a kind of timeless art of really being able to go beyond mere inference and, and just kind of basic uh, guessing to actually really trying to de determine what's going to happen in the future. So oracles and prophecies and uh, the mantic arts have been around for a very long time and they've been used in lots of different ways and different traditions and ways to get towards those kind of mantic arts. So I'm going to be talking about psychedelomancy, which is probably a completely made up word uh, as of now. And so that's the use of psychedelic substances to predict the future. And we're talking about pre precognition, what we call precognition, and controlled experiments exploring that. So to give you the kind of uh, the, the backstory history, uh, shamanic cultures from around the world, or people, shamans in different cultures are going to alter states of consciousness at will to transcend space and time in the name of their community and bring back useful information. Uh, maybe from a distant location or from the future. I'm going to be talking mostly about the future. And so we have the use of psychedelic substances the world over uh, on every continent of the planet and probably for thousands of years shamans have been using these plants to transcend space and time such as the uh, Huicholis or Borradica who happen to be gracing us here with their presence this weekend from Mexico and their use of peyote cactus or perhaps the Mazatecs, their use of psilocybin mushrooms or maybe the Tungus and the use of fly garrigs and Amanita, <laughs> uh, or maybe in India with the use of, say, Dachura, or perhaps Australia with Pachuri, or Africa with Imboga, or Syria with Syrian Roo, and North Africa. And of course, South America, we have a, a veritable cornucopia of different psychedelic plants which have been used. This is the Shua. Um, and so in the West, we've uh, only really recently discovered these substances in about the last 100 years or so, uh, with the exception perhaps of nitrous and, and mescaline, uh, people like Albert Hoffman. And we find that those very first explorers and discoverers of psychedelic substances all had their own paranormal-like experiences. So Albert Hoffman, of course, famously in his first LSD trip, had an out-of-body experience and, and perceived his body from, from a kind of disembodied perspective yeah, put by the ceiling and thought it died. Um, we know also that this man here, this actually is a man who looks a little bit like a little wizened old lady, but this is Humphrey Osmond in his uh, later years, uh, the man who was credited with coining the term psychedelic, of course, in, in conjunction with Aldous Huxley. And of course, uh, both uh, Osmond and Huxley were very much advocates of the idea that psychedelics can help you transcend space and time and uh, they very much thought they, they give you access to these kind of paranormal-like realms of information. Uh, Huxley, of course, borrowed his ideas from Henri Bergson, the French philosopher, who had this idea that the brain is not so much a producer of consciousness, which is a very trendy idea in neuroscience at the minute, but that the brain is more a, a receiver of consciousness. And uh, Huxley had kind of advanced that idea and thought that it was even more than that, it's it a kind of filter of consciousness. It's, we have this kind of brain to help us be, stop being overwhelmed with experiencing everything in the entire universe, forwards and backwards in time and everywhere, simultaneously. Uh, so and that's what we call the ego. And he said that psychedelics, once they'd been discovered from, uh, had been given mescaline by, by Humphrey Osmond, that psychedelics enabled you to turn off the or turn down the reducing valve of the brain, or turn off the reducing valve of the brain, and allow all that consciousness in. Um, which, interestingly enough, and I won't dwell on this, but uh, when we finally got round to doing some brain imaging studies with psychedelics, since prohibition has kind of got in the way of doing that until about 2012, in, in the UK here, certainly at least, and Robin Carr Harris's fantastic group at Imperial College. Now, when they did this study, and they put people in an fMRI scanner, and um, if you'd asked any kind of brain imaging neuroscientist worth their fantastic fMRI grants, what happens in the brain when you give someone a psychedelic? Well, most of them will said there'll be some kind of increase in activity and they'd all have their own pet theories about where that might be. You know, it could be a bit of activity here or someone would say, oh, there's going to be activity in this part of the brain. 
and they didn't see any increase in activity, but in fact a, a decrease in activity in this key region, the default mode network, which somewhat ties in with Huxley's theory, which I suggested to Robin, because uh, he, ha he hadn't really known about that. Uh, and so there is some kind of... Um, some kind of correlation there between kind of Huxley's nascent kind of neurochemical musings about the, the nature of, of consciousness and psychedelics. Uh, seeing a decrease was surprising, said Robin. We thought profound experience equaled more activity, but no. So that was with psilocybin. And of course, even the, the, the first discoveries of psilocybin use um, in Europe, supposedly, according to Andy Lecter, our good friend, don't go back any further in the historical record, at least, than uh, 1953, when, of course, the, the Wassons went to Mexico and discovered the, the Mazatec Indians' use of psilocybin. And the Wassons first of all met with this uh, man here, Don Arulio. And Don Arulio took some mushrooms for Wasson in a ritual. Wasson didn't take them the first time. And told Wasson two things about his uh, son back home uh, in New York that neither Watson knew at that time, or, or this guy should have known, probably, because he lived up the side of a mountain, he had to get to via donkeys. So how did he know what was happening with his son back home in New York? The two things turned out to be true when Watson went home, and one of them hadn't even happened yet. So it, it was something that happened shortly after he returned. So somewhat demonstrating ostensible precognition, perhaps. Uh, of course, um, the psilocybin came back to Albert Hoffman, who'd earlier discovered LSD. They tried testing the, uh, they're trying to identify the psilocybin mushrooms active alkaloids, uh, psilocybin mushrooms active alkaloids, I should say, and they've given it to various pharmaceutical companies to test, and they tested it on animals, and animals don't really tell you when they're tripping, and some ended up in the lab of Albert Hoffman, and uh, he did the sensible thing, you know, he, he did a simple chromatography separation and he tore the, the paper with the different alkaloids into strips and gave them to his lab assistants and took some himself and they all did a bit of a lottery on who got the alkaloids. And, uh, but this time he had a bit of a precaution in that because of his kind of near death like experience the first time in LSD, he had a medical doctor with him in the room. But the doctor, of course, it didn't really help him because the doctor came over with his stethoscope to te take his pulse and he peered to Albert as an Aztec priest uh, with a large obsidian knife coming to cut out his beating heart. Uh, so he'd rather wish he hadn't had a doctor on that occasion. But Albert also noticed that when he gave other people psilocybin, uh, perhaps um, from the mushroom or even just synthetic psilocybin, which he, he, he was the first to synthesize, that people would naively report, they didn't know the, the provenance, the origins of this, this new substance, that they would often see Aztec artwork and imagery and temples and Mayan artwork and imagery and temples, even though that they, they, they didn't know it originated from Mexico itself. And, Al, and uh, Albert was convinced it was some kind of psychometry whereby the people taking the psilocybin were resonating with the original users or the consciousness of the original users of this, uh, this, this substance. And of course, um, that, such as the Mazatec Indians and Maria Sabino we have here. So I mean, we have all these stories from all the, the earliest explorers of psychedelics. Um, and I won't dwell on that. But uh, of course, they, they, they then began leaking out of the laboratories and into the therapeutic settings. People like Stanislav Grof, psychedelic psychotherapist, conducted uh, thousands of four, over 4,000 psychedelic psychotherapy sessions in a 20-year career. And as a bit of an occupational hazard, he said, he observed patients experiencing past life recall, out of body experiences, ESP, particularly precognition, accurate remote viewing, and space time travel on a daily basis. This is an occupational hazard for psychedelic psychotherapists. And uh, we have the same accounts from all other psychotherapists. Uh, we don't see these kind of reports coming from ordinary non psychedelic psychotherapy on, on this kind of daily basis, I hasten to add. But the psychedelics didn't stay in the therapy rooms, they became used recreationally, of course, like people like Danny the dealer here. And where we have some survey information from those people, such as Charles Tart, that reports of telepathy and things like precognition are very prevalent amongst users of psychedelics. So we have this kind of anecdotal wealth of, of stories. And also, the more psychedelics that people use, guess what, the more experiences they have. So to, particularly telepathy. Um, so, and I even, con I actually did some research on this. I conducted my own survey and, and I found the same thing, but I actually compared it to non-psychedelic drugs. 
So these are the prevalence rates. We see precognition only 21%, but telepathy 50%. And this is the people having these experiences under the influence. And we compare that to non-psychedelic drugs. We get people reporting these experiences under the influence of other psychoactive drugs at about 2%. So this is something very particular to psychedelics, which induces these experiences of uh, transcending space and time, having interconnections with other people. But these are just experiences. You know, people could be high as a kite and deluded. So how do we actually verify their experiences? We need to look to controlled experiments. And we're probably all familiar with the, the parapsychology research at that time, these card guessing scenarios. You see them, the little kind of wave line stars. Uh, square, what we call Zener cards, and the idea would be you have uh, maybe a distant person and they would be looking at one card in a telepathy condition and they'd try and send the information to you and your idea would be that you would, you would try and receive this image and you'd guess one of five symbols. It's a very much a forced choice. You have a choice between five different symbols and they're very simple. And it's, com it's quite constrained and the effects are quite small, so they get people to repeat this over and over and over again lots and lots of times, maybe for hours, before you can get the kind of significance you need. Um, uh, it got a bit more updated and high-tech as we moved through the years. Uh, here we go, it's a kind of classic, uh, probably 70s, I'm guessing, by his side, uh, kind of uh, ESP laboratory. And of course, the, the telltale ashtray in the lab, I love that. <laughs> uh, so there was a number of forced choice design, these kind of simple card guessing tasks with uh, psychedelics, a number of experiments conducted, various ones, LSD, mostly in the, si the 60s and 70s. Uh, a few with, here we go, some of the substances. And they typically uh, did this kind of repeating the, the guessing task for several hours. And their participants in all but one of these studies were completely naive to psychedelics. So these are people who have never taken any psychedelics before. And you get them in the lab and you get them to try and guess cards for three hours. And of course people said, well, it was pretty boring. Uh, going as far as saying it was actually psychedelically immoral to get them to do this whilst they're having their first <laughs> mystical experience. They want me to do what? Um, so perhaps not unsurprisingly, the results of those experiments were not very impressive. They were more or less a chance. A couple of them were slightly significant, but they weren't very well controlled either. But there's another kind of design we have in, in, in conducting telepathy kind of experiments or clairvoyance, and that is what we call free response. So you just basically close your eyes and perhaps maybe in some uh, in a Gansfeld or something in uh, you know your limited kind of sensory input, but you're, you're turning inwards and you you just um, look to your mental imagery to try and kind of bring out something. And the idea is you're, you're trying to get the mental imagery of a distant target, perhaps, or, or somebody else's mind. And it could be uh, an image in, in a, a different room or an object or a video playing somewhere. Um, so we have this uh, other type of design. It's called free response. So you just kind of say whatever imagery you're seeing. It's not, it doesn't have to be a star or a wavy line. It could be anything. And then there would be some target. And there was a number of different experiments done in, in this format, uh, including John Smithies, who was one of Osmond's um, contemporaries. Him and Humphrey Osmond went to a Saskatchewan and set up their, their first uh, clinic there with psychedelics. Actually, John Smithies is still alive in his late 90s, and he's still director of some neuroscience uh, research center in the, in the States. It's quite an extraordinary character, and still writing about psychedelics and parapsychology. Uh, so just, this kind of goes out to John Smithies, really. Uh, so there was a number of other experiments then with this more kind of open, free response design. And on the whole, those experiments were more successful. Uh, more than half of them returned successful results. So there you go. That's fantastic. That's the take-home message. They found successful results for uh, psychedelic ESP experiments. Except that those studies weren't very well controlled. Uh, often they didn't have a placebo condition as a comparison. Uh, sometimes they do telepathy experiments with the person sat in the same room opposite them, which obviously has its problems in, in terms of nonverbal communication or sensory leakage. You can pick up other kind of information or inference from another person. So if you're going to do a telepathy experiment, you want them to be certainly out of the room and hopefully a long way away. Um, so those experiments, although they, they were quite positive, were badly controlled. And so there's no kind of hard evidence for the existence of psychedelic uh, precognition or psychedelic ESP. 
Um, in fact, no one actually did any precognition experiments, uh, but these were all telepathy and clairvoyance. Uh, however, I would say that the, the results of those studies were <laughs> promising. But it prompted me to try and do some research myself. So I initially began working with uh, ayahuasca in Brazil. I see this is a schwa, they're not in Brazil, but never mind. They are drinking ayahuasca. And of course, you know, ayahuasca is usually a mixture of at least two plants, such as chacruna, which contains DMT, and ayahuasca, the vine, which contains various harmless alkaloids, which, you know, allow you to ingest the DMT orally, as uh, Dennis was telling us. But when they first isolated um, harmine, I believe, or harmaline, I can't remember which one it is exactly, uh, there was a, a Colombian chemist and he isolated it and he called it telepathy uh, because of the, the number of reports of people having actually clairvoyant experiences, you know, seeing, going to distant locations and seeing dead relatives or, 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 or discovering their relatives had died even um, from all the earliest explorers. So this seemed like a good substance to study to try and find ESP with psychedelics. So I developed a, a uh, it was a development from some earlier precognition research I'd, I'd conducted. It was, it was actually the task I had was an unconscious task. So you just get people to do it and they don't really know they're doing an ESP task. And so you're just getting them to give quick responses. So I tried to adapt this for my, um, my ayahuasca experiment. We looked at different variables, depth of AS, ASC and paranormal beliefs and uh, was conducted over four ceremonies in Brazil and two in Ecuador, um, a couple of pilot sessions first of all to, just to see how it worked and ultimately I had uh, 29 ayahuasca participants and 11 control participants. Um, ultimately I didn't get complete data from nine of them but I did have 20 which is my target. Uh, I aimed to have a, a, an experimental group of 20 and uh, I'll tell you the results but this is the basic setup. So the idea is you would see four Images, fractal images, these are all kind of randomly generated and very neutral, you know, they have no kind of cultural baggage attached to them. And the idea is, well, before you see those, you close your eyes under the influence and try and visualise a fractal image. And of course, then you'd open your eyes and you'd click the button, you would see four images and you basically pick the one you think most is like your mental imagery at uh, the, the moment before, having had the intention to try and identify what is the target. So you'd click on the button. Now we don't know what the actual target is yet. Um, and in fact, nobody knows because it hasn't even been determined what the target is. Uh, and then once the person makes their selection, then the computer at random, using a random number generator, selects the target from one of these four. So if you are able to get the same one as a computer, um, you'd have to be getting the information from the future. Um, Unless, of course, it was just coincidence. And we know the incidence of coincidence in this level of uh, experimentation is 25%. We have one in four chance of somehow guessing the same thing as a computer. So basic set up, 10 trials of that. People in an ayahuasca ceremony, including myself, because uh, I was always uh, indebted, I was always kind of asked to take part before they'd actually let me go into the ceremony and collect data. So that get a little extra added challenge to doing this research. Um, and I had a control group, uh, match pairs, I won't go into that, but they were more or less alike in some ways, but not others. The results were that after two or three years of returning to South America to collect this data, um, we find that in the, so, well, the, the first one is a pretest, and then the second one is a post-test. And you find the blue line, which is ayahuasca, that before ayahuasca and then after ayahuasca, you'll notice there's a bit of a decline. So they actually do worse uh, after the use of ayahuasca in this experiment, uh, which may seem a little bit depressing after collecting all this data for three years, but then if you realize that even in the control condition, they also do worse uh, the second time you test them in a in virtually parallel way to the ayahuasca. And the ayahuasca group actually did better than the control group, the match control at the outset, but they both did worse after doing the test once. They did the second time, they both got worse. So was, this tells you there's something wrong with the test. There's some kind of order effects going on. So it's not that they're not necessarily being precognitive. Um, so that was uh, a bit disappointing. Um, however, the, um, there were some little insights from it. First of all, that the experiment was probably not ideal. Uh, one thing is those fractal images, they all look very similar. They're just kind of colourful images, often with a little black Mandelbrot set in the middle. And if you're trying to get a person to make a decision, like choose between four 
different things, you want them to be as different as possible, not as similar as possible. So they're very homogenous when they should be very heterogeneous. So that was a bit of a problem. Um, find this, uh, so there could be uh, kind of order effects, decline effects. Uh, there was a kind of slight correlation with uh, the depth of the altered state of consciousness. People tended to do a bit better if they're in a deeper state of altered consciousness. But uh, on the whole, they, they, these weren't very conclusive uh, findings. Uh, so, but luckily, I didn't leave it there. Uh, while I was in Ecuador doing research with ayahuasca, having taken ayahuasca in these ceremonies and trying to conduct experiments, it wasn't that easy either. So I opted to, um, whilst in Ecuador, research San Pedro cactus instead, uh, which I find, you know, mescaline is probably a bit easier to deal with. And so I wandered around the Andes trying to find a, a San Pedro Curandero to let me do my experiments. And I found one and he was like, yes, fantastic. Come into my, exper come into my, come into my sweat lodge and you can run your ESP experiment. I was like, great. And then I pulled out my laptop and of course he went, oh, no, none of that uh, electromagnetic juju in here. You'll scare off the spirits. So that was a bit disappointing, uh, given <laughs> that I'd been given a grant to uh, collect data. And I, I planned to collect uh, 20 data from 20 people doing one trial each. But I figured, well, if you can't get 20 people to do your experiment and do one trial each, you get one person to do all 20 trials. And that's more or less the same thing. Uh, so that was me, obviously. Uh, but I had a slightly different design. A better design, I hope. And the, the idea was that uh, there'll be four stages, but you would have dynamic targets this time. So there'll be video, one minute video clips would be the, the objects of you're trying to, the target you're trying to view. And um, they were kind of heterogeneous. They were very different from each other. They'd been selected by another researcher and they were in pools of four. So there was a different pool for each trial, uh, 20 trials. Uh, and the, the basic procedure was this. It was a visualization, then viewing, then voting, then verification. It's very V for Vendetta, I know. But, so the visualization, close your eyes, try and visualize the, the target, whatever that might be. Then you'd, you'd write that down. This is what I can see. And um, then you'd view the four video clips one at a time. And then you would vote on them. Well, I would vote. I'd then rank them, rank order them, actually on a scale from one to 100 how similar they were to my mental imagery. And then finally, we'd verify it, so see whether I actually got it right or not, and would run a random number generator uh, to try and determine the target, and then see if I got a hit or not. So this was the basic setup around the study, uh, around the 20 trials, all in one session. Good thing about uh, mescaline, it lasts you know, 12 hours, so after the first couple of hours of nausea, you've got a lot of time to do your research. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what that is, something about getting high on San Pedro, I'm not sure. So I'll just give you, I'll give you, I haven't got much time, so I'll just give you a couple of cherry-picked examples of, if you've probably all seen these, if you've ever been to any of my talks. Uh, so this was my very first, this is actually, the, I, this was just the pilot trial. I didn't even use this data in the final analysis, although it was a really quite a good hit, I would say. I don't know if we've got any audio. So I'd written, a, a, and the idea was just to try and get one or two things, you know, just concrete things that you could write down. Nothing too much. You don't have reams of kind of description of things and because you want to make it as simple as possible to try and identify the clip with your imagery. So this was ancient Greek scene, eyes, and then a little note to myself, visuals are too vague and fluid. What a surprise. The one thing about mescaline enhances your mental imagery. And then a city at night on a lake. And this was the, the very first clip from the pilot trial. There's probably no audio, or probably no video even at this rate. Maybe you'll have to use your, <laughs> your powers of visualization. Here we go. Oh, there's no audio, unfortunately, which is a shame. But uh, yeah, some ancient Greek dude fighting a minotaur. I must say, I was deeply engrossed in this and I found myself kind of clinging onto the desk when the minute ran out and I'm like looking at this thing and wow, what, what happened next? And then I remembered what I was doing and I looked down at what I'd written and it said ancient Greek scene. I was like, well, that's not bad, is it? I mean, there wasn't a city at night in the lake, forgive me, but that was like, oh, that's encouraging at least. So that was uh, one example. I'll just give you one more on, before I give you some more results. Um, so this is, uh, oh, I've skipped that one. I'm not going to go into this one, other than that, I'll go into this one very quickly. So sometimes the, 
they weren't always kind of direct as that. So they'd be very thematic, perhaps. So you get things like this, um, rotating like helicopter blades, space, more mechanical stuff, spacecraft, space skeletons, water, submarine, but a big rig, but underwater. So that was what I saw. Um, and this was one of the clips from Star Wars. Now, I didn't see a clip from Star Wars, but I did see spacecraft, uh, space skeletons. Have you ever considered what a stormtrooper looks like? If you're kind of, George Lucas was going, yeah, man, we want to have some kind of futuristic skeleton, and we came up with the stormtrooper. Um, more mechanical stuff. Well, it doesn't get any more mechanical than the Death Star, does it? I mean, it's like a planet-sized mechanical thing, and so on and so forth. Oh, and then ultimately, pulling out of his utility belt, he's got this little grappling hook, which I actually then paused at the precise moment, and it's got like three little helicopter blade grappling hook. And I was like, well, that's pretty good correspondence. That'll do for me. And of course, I chose that one as a target, uh, gave it a high rating, and then the random number generator Luckily, happened to agree with me, and it also chose that one as a target. Now, if you don't believe me, that stormtroopers look like uh, skeletons, like futuristic skeletons. Some people, I didn't draw, draw these myself, I whipped them off the internet, believe me, you know, and aligned them to kind of Day of the Dead like characters. So, um, so that experiment, you'd be pleased to know, was a success. Um, I got a significant results, uh, especially by some of ranks, which is my chosen uh, analysis. I was uh, I pre chose to do. I only got 40% direct hits compared to 25% chance. Oh my word, I'm have to very quickly move on. Thank you, Eric, for chairing me. Uh, there was a correlation between the depth of ASC, uh, one-tailed, and also the increased meaning of the events. Often they were very suffused in meaning. I'm going to skip all of that, and I'll very quickly tell you about the two other experiments since then. One has been on an LSD clinical drug trial. I kind of piggyback this study on, on it. Had 13 participants, there was a pre-dose and then a, a, a during LSD precognition task. Um, they're on 50, 75 or 100 milligrams, mi milligrams, no that would be pretty heavy, micrograms of pure LSD and uh, frequent response, same design essentially. And these are the results, so uh, pre-LSD, these are the kind of target ranks. Uh, so first place is like a direct hit and a four, fourth place rank is a complete miss. So in pre-LSD, they're kind of at chance. So the difference from chance statistically, it's virtually a chance. But then in the LSD condition, uh, it was actually significant in the opposite direction. It was significant in the opposite direction. So people were missing the target. They were, they were choosing the target as their, their least kind of desired outcome. Uh, and this is quite interesting. Um, so why is it they were choosing it as least desired outcome? because I think they were scientists. These were all PhD, top level scientists from Cambridge and Oxford and Imperial College. Uh, and we found also that there was some, uh, have I lost it? There was some correlation, what's going on with my, yeah, there's some correlations, uh, that's, uh, my slide just, this is why I didn't get as far as this when updating my slides before the talk. I'm gonna finish in a second. There was a negative correlation with neuroticism, so they scored worse uh, in terms of and, and the more neurotic they were. But there was also a positive correlation with extroversion and a positive correlation with openness to experience. So those who were kind of more open and extroverted did better, and those who were quite neurotic did quite badly. But because this group did very badly, I mean significantly badly, they were obviously quite neurotic scientists, but it got a significant effect. I repeated the experiment with 15 people on San Pedro as well more recently, and we've got the same effect, we've got Psy missing. So anyway, I've run out of time completely. You didn't give me the stop sign. No, I didn't give ah, you the stop sign. So that's it. I'll talk more about that on the panel if you want. Thank you very much.